Hello, everyone, and welcome to the eCoffee with Experts brought to you by Digital Web Solutions. My name is Matt Fraser, the host of eCoffee with Experts. And on today's show, I have with me uh, David Woodbury. Uh, David is the CEO of Rev7, which is a digital agency with a primary focus on supporting high growth e commerce and crypto startup companies. Uh, Rev7 is headquartered in the beautiful Black Hills of South Dakota. As a serial entrepreneur, David has created a startup launch pad out of Rev7 that's created three venture-backed businesses. Lately, he has been working within the crypto space and is focused on marketing strategies within the evolving ecosystem that is Web3. His latest projects are Folio Boost, which is a crypto fantasy trading game, and Web3 DGENs, which aims to organize a gig economy for Web3 projects. When he's not working, David is regionally is a regionally sponsored cyclist and can be found at some of the top gravel and mountain bike races across the country. Once again, David, thanks for so much for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. All right. Oh, right on, right on. So, David, um, where did you grow up? Um, yeah, I grew up in uh, a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul called White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Um, oh, okay. And uh, yeah, I spent most of my uh, my younger years uh, in that area, um, and then um, uh, after, I guess when nine eleven hit, I joined the Coast Guard, and that sort of uh, spurred oh. my uh, tour around the country. I've lived in nine different states so far now. So, oh wow, that must yeah. have been uh, an adventure, so to speak, of seeing different parts of the country in that capacity. Absolutely, yeah. All right on. Right on. So um, I know you're an entrepreneur. You, you started several businesses uh, from your LinkedIn profile. Did you always know that you wanted to be uh, your own boss and your own, like, starting your own businesses and things like that? Well, uh, I wanted to be a professional athlete, but I wasn't born as a six foot five, 250 pound uh, uh, oh, linebacker. Okay. So that didn't really <laughs> work out for me. Um, okay. And, uh, uh, but my, my grandfather, I would say, is probably uh, an inspiration for me. He he was a small business owner, um, started an industrial supply company in the Twin Cities uh, in St. Paul. And um, and then he had a couple of branches in sort of rural Minnesota. Um, and uh, as a young person, uh, when I was like 18, 19, 20, I would spend summers working, um, working in the warehouse or working the city desk mm -hmm. in the sales, retail sales, um, and just sort of watching his, uh, his experience as an entrepreneur. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really sort of got the bug going for me and, um, uh, realizing, uh, that, you know, you can build extraordinary wealth. Uh, there's no cap, I guess, on, on your income opportunities as an entrepreneur. And that was always an exciting, um, uh, an exciting thing for me to strive towards. Right on, right on. So what was one of the first businesses you yourself started? Um, well, I tried, like, I tried to start a Jimmy John's franchise, but I was 19 years old and nobody would finance me. It would have crushed oh. it too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was my first attempt uh, going down to the banks and trying to get, uh, this is like, uh, actually it was right before I joined the Coast Guard. So it was like 1999 or 2000. And, um, uh, so yeah, I, I attempted that didn't work out. Um, so I uh, obviously didn't move forward with that, but, um, at, shortly after I had got in the Coast Guard, um, like many young people, I got into some credit card debt, um, made some hmm. bad decisions with, with debt. And, uh, through that process, I learned how to repair my own credit. Um, mm -hmm. and so my first business was actually a credit repair business. I had, I was consulting and I had a bunch of clients where I was repairing their credit and, uh, wow. and that was an interesting, um, uh, interesting sort of opportunity. I was just doing it on the side while I was actually working at Verizon corporate. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, there's definitely a need for it and, um, just learning experience and, and applying what I had learned myself to, you know, I think. I was, uh, I figured out a way to increase my score by a hundred points or something like that. So it was valuable wow. to the people. I'm it to. 
So you took a, a negative and turned it into a positive. And then yeah, I mean, made, I think money, that's how most, made money uh, doing it. Yeah, I think that's how most businesses start. It's um, find a problem and then figure out a solution um, to that process. So Yeah. And the bigger the problem and the bigger solution, would you say ties into the bigger the earning potential? Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, is it scalable? Is scalable being like, can it be? And that was the thing with the credit repair. It wasn't really scalable um, because it was just my time working on this. Um, so, uh, but that, but it was my first, first learning experience, you know, signing up a client, um, having a, having a client, having some accountability. Um, hey, I'm trying to, to provide this service. Um, Hey, you, you need to start paying your bills on time. That's part of the deal. So, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a good experience. And I think um, uh, going from there and then learning like levels of scalability, like each business I've done since then has had maybe a little bit more scalability to it. Okay. So you mentioned that you worked for Verizon. I was, I was reading on your LinkedIn profile, uh, the story of how you started one store and then grew it to uh, several. Um, what was that like, that whole process? And how many stores did you grow? Uh, the Verizon franchises, you started several? Um, yeah, we. I started 18. Um, 18. Yeah, so my journey there was, uh, this was in the mid 2000s and I knew uh, uh, wireless services in, in the between 2000 and 2010 were just exploding. Everybody was buying mm. and the, and the technology was evolving. So we were going from, mm. you know, the first phones I was selling were just simple flip phones. And then there was camera phones and then there was smartphones. And then pretty soon mm. there was the iPhone. Um, and so there, there was this just like massive evolution and adoption to the industry. Um, mm. And so I started off with Verizon corporate as a sales manager at a kiosk. Uh, it was number two kiosk in the country. Uh, wow. Then I opened a, uh, a retail store and ended up running that to the number one store in the country for Verizon. And wow. <clears throat> over those three years, I was making really good money, six figures as a young person. And um, mm-hmm. um, I just thought, hey, I, when I found the franchise model for Verizon, I thought I've saved up enough money now. I had a, a friend of mine from high school that had some capital to invest. And so he came in as a, as an investing partner <clears throat> and then I was the operator mm-hmm. and, and some of my capital as well. We opened one store and um, uh, like most businesses, we took on an SBA loan um, and within six months we were able to pay off that first loan. And so then wow. we had the, loan balances available. And with that, we were able to basically um, go out and um, uh, build a second store. So, mm-hmm. you know, we were, we were essentially um, scaling the business with this, this loan. And then one of our key employees uh, that had come on, his dad had recently sold his business for a, a large sum of money. Um, mm-hmm interested in becoming an investor in our, our growing business. And so he came in and, um, and then, you know, we had a, an additional capital partner in, in, a, in addition to, you know, the, the loans and the things that we were taking on. So from there, we just kept growing and um, we had five stores in the Minnesota market. We had um, six uh, stores in the St. Louis market. And then we had seven stores in the Dallas market. Um, and then in wow. 2012, a large, uh, a large Verizon um, premium retailer, so somebody that had like over 100 stores, came and um, bought out the majority of our business. Wow! So yes. number one, what was the what was your what do you attribute your success? Like I, you know, you mentioned you were a sales manager, so obviously you were a good salesperson. It, it, was that one of the, did you learn how to, did you, were you a born salesperson? Did you learn how to sell? Did you take courses? Did you, uh, well, I think it's just come back naturally to, to you. To like my, uh, working in my grandpa's shop. Um, and I learned to, I think sales is a learning to associate yourself with in the customer's shoes, the best mm-hmm. way possible and be as likable as possible. Mm-hmm. And, um, like in that circumstance, I was selling, um, 
like industrial fasteners and things of that nature to um, to uh, construction workers essentially. And mm-hmm. so uh, mm-hmm. I didn't have a lot of background in construction, and I wasn't this like you know rough tough guy that was out fishing every weekend and hunting every weekend. Mm-hmm. But I mm-hmm. learned about I I I would go study about fishing and hunting and 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 go and I did it a few times mostly so I would have things to talk about and associate wow. with the um and <laughs> that's amazing uh, so yeah it was just like I think um I that's sales 101 is like be likable to, to your target demographic and um mm-hmm. and wireless it was a little different because it was it was much broader and it was just like everybody wanted these products so it was more about speed um and then keeping them working and providing good customer service because people were constantly breaking devices and mm-hmm. uh you know so the the service side of that business was really important if you wanted to bring it back or bring customers back but i would mm-hmm. say the main contributor to like verizon growth was uh we were retail oriented and everybody was focused on just dealing with the um uh, the retail customers that would come through your door. And, um, the difference for us was we really went after B2B. So oh. we, uh, Verizon had these discount codes for employees back then of certain, of certain big corporations, like let's say Home okay. Depot Depot had an 18% discount. So we would go into like Home Depot and talk to like all their employees at like an employee stand up about um, like the Verizon discount because it was a perk for for um, Home Depot yeah. employees. We'd come in, let them know the discounts, <clears throat> let them know the discounts on devices. And we ended up flipping a lot of people from competitors like AT&T or Sprint or T-Mobile back then. So. Wow. So you leveraged some of the programs of Verizon in order to grow the business by going after B2B uh, yeah, so it was just like more one ask more. Ask, like standing there That's, and waiting for a customer to swing through the door, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Man, that is so smart. Um, so, so your first business chart, I asked that question. Um, when, when did you know to exit the Verizon venture that you were in? Was it just, was it the, the offer on the table for the, the money or was, was there another reason that you decided to exit that? There was another reason. Um, uh, in 2011, March 2011, Verizon got the iPhone, and uh-huh. uh, 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 sales, as far as like demand, was exploding. But the profit margin on that device was like um, ten cents on the dollar compared to other devices that we were selling. Oh. And so um, I was watching our profitability go down significantly, and I was watching. Uh-huh. Um, the larger retailers um, gain bigger contracts and we weren't getting it as a smaller retailer. Mm-hmm. So really it was kind of a, a situation where I looked like, I looked at it like they're going to squeeze. I, I think they're going to squeeze out the smaller retailers in the space. So we either need to like figure out how to scale the 300 stores or, uh-huh. um, or we need to just get acquired. <clears throat> so I actually initiated the sale process process by um, listing on biz buy sell, um, finding an individual that was interested, and then through that I found uh, then two of the bigger retailers came in, and then we had kind of a, a little you know com- competing deal or whatever to sell uh-huh. the business. We ended up selling one of the we ended up selling one of the markets to one, and then two of the markets to another um, retailer. Oh wow! So. So yeah, it was a, it was definitely, it was, it was a kind of a complex deal, but it was like understanding that my biggest thing about like building a franchise was that I didn't control anything on the compensation structures. So um, that was like a pretty big learning experience. There is like Verizon could change compensation um, at any given time, which would really affect or potentially really affect our profitability of our business. Model. Yeah. Would you start a franchise again? I mean, obviously you didn't, so I think that answers it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't. Um, uh-huh. I think there's like, I have a really, I have a, I have a good friend of mine that he's one of the top franchise consultants in the country. Um, oh, wow. And um, yeah, he places people into like passive income franchises all the time. And so those are really interesting. But um, I, 
for from my standpoint, I think like I tried to evolve my skill sets past like retail because mm -hmm. I was talking about the beginning of this um, scalability is really something to me that's that's important um, with business models and um, and so looking at like you know you uh, most franchises require infrastructure like leases buildings um, uh, materials furnitures equipment all that kind of stuff and I like businesses now that are built on technology so software and and can scale you know outside of that so yeah way easier to scale those things than uh, traditional brick and brick and mortar business right um, I found it very interesting that you you started a a cause marketing agency after exiting Verizon called linked cause uh, what was your motivation for for doing so? Um, well, I was, um, I had a little bit of leeway with my financial situation after selling the Verizon stores. So I wanted to, I, I was, um, uh, I had read about Blake McCoskey, the founder of Tom's Shoes. Oh, and I thought, yeah. I thought what Blake was doing was really interesting as far as like using a capitalist approach a capitalism approach to to potentially provide some good in the world uh -huh. and um so i thought that one for one model was really interesting and mm -hmm. uh so i you know I, I, up until this point i'd never built a brand or done anything myself um and so it was uh it was we built a brand called eat apply and what eat applied mm -hmm. and that was that was a, a, a under the linked cause cause marketing umbrella and what eat apply did is um partnered with local restaurants to donate a meal to a local food shelf whenever somebody purchased a certain entree um mm -hmm. and so the, the way we we would position this is uh we provided some marketing materials um and then um you know some uh, web presence that would talk about the different restaurants that are involved um, and, and then we, we were able to get quite a bit of like local media attention, um, into the markets that we were able to get restaurants to sign up. Um, uh, and yeah, it was pretty cool. We ended up donating, we, I think in 2013, we were a top 10 cause marketing campaign in the U S. Um, we ended up donating over a million meals to food shelves and, um, and hunger nonprofits across the U.S. Uh, market, and then um, yeah, from there, I uh, as a business model, it wasn't very successful because it cost so much to sign up the restaurants, and then they would they would stay on for a period of time, but a lot of times they decide to go Jump. do something else after three months or something. So retention oh, okay. retention wasn't great. Cost of acquisition was high, <clears throat> and um, you know, we were donating 80% of the proceeds to the actual food shelves. So um, there wasn't, there just was like a very tiny margin, but oh, okay. that experience really kind of got me going with like digital marketing and like um, uh, sort of stem the evolution and, and push into Rev7, which became, which really started off just as a digital agency that we, we launched um, in 2014. Wow. So you launched that in 2014. Was that, uh, and I, I, the word evolved, did it, did you start Rev7 or was it an, did you partner with someone or how did that venture yeah, come I, about? I started, uh, I started Rev7 and, um, and so with, with Eat Apply and Linked Cause, I had gone through an accelerator program. Okay. So there's, business accelerator, like startup business accelerator programs. So yeah. um, I thought that was really neat. And I learned a ton um, through that process. So then I, I had this idea for Camp Native, which is a booking engine for campsites um, all across yeah. the country. And um, uh, so I was, what I was doing with Rev7 is it was a startup agency. We were, uh, I wanted to help companies that were going through these types of programs, startup programs and help them look about, look for ways to scale. So we okay. signed a couple of clients and then, and then I had the idea for Cam Native. And so I got that into an accelerator and then got that, got 
raised a million dollars of venture capital for that. Um, oh wow! And um, and by 2015, we were we were really running Camp Native and not doing much with Ref Seven. We were handling a handful of clients, <clears throat> but uh-huh. for the most part, it was bringing Camp to market 2015, 2016. Um, and then uh, through that process, um, actually, I hired a, a CMO, Chief Marketing Officer at Camp Native. Um, this guy was, uh, he built uh, Chewy.com, so the uh, largest e-commerce exit in history. Um, yeah. And then uh, he built Jet Smarter, which was um, Uber for private jets. When I say he built it, he was uh, um, ran, basically head of uh, digital marketing. So okay. he's... Um, he was at, he's actually written about an SEO for dummies um, in the book. And uh, so from an organic search standpoint, digital marketing standpoint, one of the top people in the U.S. that talents I was able to bring on. And um, uh, after a couple of years of camp, he was uh, we were just sitting around a bonfire one night and um, he was like, we should we should really do something with that Rev7 agency that you've got. And yeah. uh, so I just brought him on as a partner, and uh, oh, right yeah, we've, on. Been, we've been we've been building ever since on that. Um, you know, couple couple of additional startups. Uh, we've supported about fifty different brands, um, mostly high high growth e commerce um, software companies, and then lately, you know, into the crypto space. So. Okay. The Chewy.com, was that, was that a client of, so did, I, I, forgive me, I don't know the name of the partner that you referred to, his, his first name. Yeah, his name is Brent Rangan. Brent Rangan. Did yeah. Brent, was, was, uh, was Chewy brought to, Chewy.com brought to Rev7 as a client? And then that, that incredible growth that I saw on the Rev7 website, uh, it was the biggest, uh, you said big, big, biggest e-commerce exit in history, U.S. history? Right. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so Brent actually started off there as an employee. He was employee number six at Chewy. Okay. Um, and, um, and then, uh, yeah, we ended up supporting, um, it as well, but that was, it was kind of like later stage. So Brent, Brent, um, Brent basically took them from zero to, uh, uh, 200 K monthly, Mm. Uh, uh, e-commerce sales in the course of 12 months. Um, wow. And the, at the time, the largest building or the largest link building campaign that had ever been executed. Um, and, um, and how he did it is through like a, a massive blogger outreach uh, mm-hmm. uh, deal. Um, he organized like over 2000 bloggers, uh, pet bloggers um, for for that particular industry. Um, and, um, and yeah, so, and then she actually ended up becoming a, getting acquired by PetSmart in, I think it was 2018 for $3.35. dollars oh, 3.35 so. billion. Yep. Wow. That's yeah. such, so PetSmart owns Chewy.com. Yeah. PetSmart owns huh. Chewy.com and then PetSmart took Chewy public and, uh, I think when they took them public, it was valued at like 8 billion. So it was pretty good, pretty good swing for PetSmart too. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That is just awesome. So, you know, so, and it, an interesting sidebar is uh, yeah. Ryan Cohen, the founder of Chewy is now the uh, guy that's running GameStop. So oh. all, the, all the stock manipulation and stuff that's been going on in the last year. Um, Ryan Cohen is the uh, founder of Chewy has been pretty involved with that whole uh, scenario there. So. With that. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So Rev7, uh, what, so is, who's the ideal client that Rev7 uh, looks for to help? Um, yeah, I guess right now we're, we are really interested in um, uh, decentralized applications being built. Um, so like crypto crypto Uh startups. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, we just believe, so kind of going back to my, my days in, uh, wireless, um, what I saw from like 2000 to 2010, I, I believe that that's going to happen in the crypto space this decade. Um, we're seeing, um, uh, incredible disruption to industries like, um, finance, 
um, like banking. Um, mm -hmm. So decentralized finance is, is, is really a, a really interesting opportunity where interest rates are, you know, consumers are being able to get eight, 10, 12% interest rates on stable coins. Um, and then, um, and then, and then instantaneous lending protocols um, through DeFi. Um, and then uh, Web3, you know, if you're in the internet and um, you look at like these social platforms that are out there, uh, Web3 is all about individual digital ownership on the internet. So that's really exciting to us, um, supporting anybody that's um, sort of empowering people to own pieces of the internet um, and, you know, own your data, own your profile, uh -huh. um, all of those types of things. So that's that would uh you know we right now we're mostly focused on our own projects um oh, like okay Folio boost is um is our primary objective we've got right now and folio boost is a uh crypto uh trading game um so it's like a it's a it's like FanDuel or DraftKings if you're into fantasy sports but for crypto uh -huh. um wow. and so what we wanted to do is is create a safer environment for people to trade and learn about crypto. We believe uh, we believe 500 million people are going to come to crypto in the next three years. Wow! Um, so, creating a gateway for people to um, to engage without maybe mm -hmm. the substantial risks involved with uh, um, uh, vol you know the volatility of the markets uh, that we mm -hmm. have today. So, so Folio Boost. Um, how did you get the idea for it? like a, a fantasy trading game for e e such an original idea, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, really. I mean, so just like any kind of, you know, anything that I've done in the past, it's like uh -huh. finding the pain point. <laughs> and okay. uh, so I started um, uh, as a, uh, uh, so as a, you know, the owner and CEO of Rev7, um, back when COVID hit, um, I was receiving um, the PPP deal from the government and then the EIDL deal from the government. And in my decade plus in business, I had never seen the government give away money like I, I, like I saw. Mm. And so mm -hmm. that, that actually, in my mind, it raised a red flag of mm. uh, looking into what, what is actually going on here. And how much money we printed, and and so back in 2020, when all this was happening, um, mm -hmm. I started really monitoring that pretty closely, and I noticed um, I noticed uh, that I think it was well uh, 18 months, and I think we've printed 40 percent of every U.S. dollar ever originated, like in the last 18 months. Um, yeah, so uh, that was uh, that was concerning to me. And therefore, I began looking at like um, different places to invest, you know, invest money that weren't necessarily in U.S. dollars because they're really mm -hmm. in my opinion. And um, yeah. so, uh, so crypto was on my radar. I had I'd invested for the first time in Bitcoin in like 2017, like most people at the top of the last like wave mm -hmm. uh, and then lost a bunch of money you know, um, as it went crashed down in 2018, but I ended up mm -hmm. just holding it because I didn't make a, uh, I didn't make a really big investment. I just was, it was speculative back then, but I ended mm -hmm. up doing a lot of research on the market, uh, ended up investing, uh, putting a decent chunk in, in, uh, 2020 and mm -hmm. then just letting it kind of ride. Uh, and by like January, I felt like I was probably the next Warren Buffett because my investments were up like 500%. Um, oh, wow. Uh, you know, because Bitcoin, it, it just had gone up so much um, between yeah. August of 2020 and January of 2021. And then um, I started looking into like the, uh, the different trading tools that were out there. Um, I started mm -hmm. actively trading um, and I was able to take a a five figure investment, turn it into well over seven figures by April of 2021 um, by using leverage um, leverage tools that are made available through a lot of the different trading platforms that are out there. So leverage is basically like a debt protocol. So you're okay. um, 
if but the problem is is that if there's a big capitulation event where crypto goes down um uh by you know multiple percentages uh mm-hmm. in my case you know it was like 35 percent. i had like it, it it had to go down 35 percent, and then you'd have a liquidity event liquidity event means that it auto sells your crypto to cover your um sort of the staking that you have to get that leverage right okay so anyways uh kind of a complicated process but i had learned all this stuff very quickly and i was exposing myself to it and, I, and a lot of people were exposed to it and on May 19th, Bitcoin crashed from like uh, 42,000 to 30,000 overnight. Um, mm-hmm. And it ended up seven figures worth of crypto um, in one night. Um, and would, so that was, you, a, you, was seven figures of crypto in one night? Seven figures losing of crypto. Losing or gaining? Gaining or losing? Losing. I lost, I lost losing. over okay. $1 crypto in one night. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, that experience was uh, kind of a, you know, a kick. And I was like, Whoa, yeah. this is crazy. Like I was playing with these tools that I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, and then, you know, through the summer, like last summer, and then quite, uh, recently I was actually asked to join as a, a general partner of a crypto hedge fund, which I have declined mm-hmm. because my focus is on, is on folio boost, but mm-hmm. I've improved my trading skills significantly. The thing that, that i wanted to do with folio boost was really teach people about the different tools that are out there and how the market is manipulated and how it works but uh-huh. without having like the exposure of these major capitulation events and the other thing that i noticed is that um i became somewhat of an influencer of my personal network and the state of south dakota has put me on retainer to go speak at all these different uh, events about crypto mm-hmm. so a lot People come up to me about different projects that they want to invest in now. And um, there's just a lot of focus on like these dog coins and like uh, what meme coins are called. Um, And uh, I, (laughs) I, there's so much amazing utility and technology being built in crypto today um, that I just wish, you know, we could educate people on like what those good projects are. Um, versus like just something that maybe like Elon Musk is pumping on Saturday Night Live. So um, mm. that's that's my mission with Fully Boost is really to kind of create an educational platform um, that also um, uh, also provides kind of a safety net for people to trade. But it really has the upside too. Like the the reality is is that um, people want to take a hundred bucks and turn it into ten grand and figure out how to do yeah. that. And with Folio Boost, if you're a good trader, you'll be able to do that. So, okay. Will Folio does it, will Folio Boost be a re, a place of resource for learning about crypto, what crypto is, different types of crypto? I mean, I could ask a hundred questions about that because I don't really know anything about crypto. I do know that yeah. I could have started Bitcoin mining a long time ago, and I thought it was. I thought, why is anybody gonna trust something other than physical <laughs> currency? But you know, I was wrong. <laughs> so I dismissed it and I uh, regret it. But uh, yeah, is it like is, for someone who wants to learn about crypto, will Folio, or is your goal for Folio Boost to become a hub of, of resor- a resource hub for learning and education? Like, I wouldn't say it's going to be necessarily a resource hub. It's We will have some resources there, but mostly it's going to be on um, researching the actual project. So we're pulling in like a uh, coin market cap API, but really like okay. it's a game. So we want to make okay. trading okay. fun okay. and it, it, like the actual trading side of it. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there for just like, if you want to consume content, um, there's, there's good YouTubers, there's bad YouTubers, just like any other um, industry. Okay. Um, but, you know, there's tons of, uh, resources that exist, I would say on that side for us, it's like educating people on, Hey, are you a good trader? How do you stack up? Like giving you transparency, yeah. um, in a, in a fantasy environment. Okay. So it's all, um, you're learning how to trade cryptocurrency in the, in the game, in the fantasy game, and then take that and apply and what you learned hopefully in the, in the market to make yeah. some actual yeah. real money. You know, in our circumstance, so like our game has a, basically like a, a buy-in. So we have 
uh, we, we've actually just created our own crypto. So we've got what's called oh. the boost token. And so the way it works is you buy the boost token, you enter a game, um, you compete in that game. Like let's say the buy-in might be $5. Um, and, and then the top 25% of traders are rewarded on a tiered basis, but the winner oh. might walk over 500 bucks um, in boost okay. value boost tokens. And you can exchange that for USD. Um, oh. And so uh, it's, it's really a, a rewarding um, competition. So you do have some skin in the game and there's some rewards if you do well uh, with mm. your picks. So mm. the, way, the way we do it is we give you a million dollar fantasy portfolio budget. So you have a okay. million dollars, you deploy that into seven different crypto projects. So you're going to okay. research the projects that you want to invest that budget in. Um, you submit into the competition and then it lasts, let's say three to five days, the competition might run. And at the end mm -hmm. of that, um, it's, it's stack ranked based on the total value, like how much your million dollars is able to increase. But the interesting thing about uh, Folio Boost is like, even if Bitcoin is down 50% um, mm -hmm. in that period of time and the whole market's crashed, um, we still have winners, right? Because um, it's really just how you stacked up and how you picked against other traders. Wow, that that is uh, <laughs> that is fascinating. So, if people wanted to join Folio Boost, where would where would they go? Just I might as well mention that. Um, yeah, so FolioBoost.io is our okay. site right now. We're we're launching. Um, uh, we're in product development right now, but we're launching in the uh, end of first quarter here. Um, and we have a, a whitelist there. And anybody okay. that joins that whitelist um, is going to get free boost tokens. And then okay. uh, we're going to give a million dollars in crypto away this year. Um, wow. And so, and there's going to be a, a competition where somebody wins a million dollars in crypto. And the first um, uh, uh signups that we have on that white list are going to get a free entry into that competition. It's going to be $25 mm -hmm. to buy into it. Um, and so if you sign up now on the white list, um, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to get a chance at that million dollar portfolio for free. That's, that's amazing. That is amazing. What advice, David, would you give for someone who is just starting in business from based on your experiences? Um, uh, find a good mentor would be one, um, like okay. somebody that really, cause there's so many mistakes that are, can be made in business. Like my, yeah. for me, my grandpa, um, you know, he sat me down and he said, I remember he, he this conversation was over a lunch. Uh, and he said, <laughs> he said, you're either, you either eat your own lunch or somebody else is going to eat your lunch. But it's, it's, uh, it's interesting yeah. advice. Like make sure you're taking care of yourself in business. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, uh, that's an interesting piece because we, um, we always end up thinking about the business first, um, and maybe employees first, maybe, uh, the, the clients first, but ultimately if you're not taking care of yourself, um, you know, with, with the input, like education, whether, you know, there's, there's different levels of that there's physical, like lots of entrepreneurs, um, they quit working out, they quit exercising. Um, and, um, uh, for me, like early on in my, in my career, um, that was how I was, uh, just 100% in on my business and not really having a lot of balance. Um, and, Lately, in the past few years, like cycling's become a big part of my life, and I lost oh, yeah. thirty-five pounds, got in shape, have way more energy, uh, work less hours, and, and I'm much more productive. Um, and wow. it's because I have better balance in my life, and so I think that's really important for um, for entrepreneurs to understand that, and and just um, invest. Uh, you know, it's it, we have a choice. Like every day. Like last night I had a choice if I wanted to like sit and watch another, like, like figure out a Netflix series to watch or listen to an audiobook. And, uh -huh. um, I was scrolling through the different Netflix things and I just decided, ah, there's nothing like worth my time right now. And so I downloaded a new audiobook and, and listened to that for an hour before I went to bed. And those are the choice we are faced with those choices every day. Um, and, mm -hmm. and how you decide to invest your time 
is the most, I mean, it's the most important commodity you have. So um, if you want to get better at something, um, there's always the information is out there to, uh, to, um, to do that. We live in just this unbelievable era of humankind where information is, is free and it's available. Yeah. Anything you want to do <laughs> right yeah. there. Yeah. You can literally learn almost anything um, you want. Yeah. It's uh, like the, the city that I live in uh, with a free library card, you can get access to LinkedIn learning for free, which is like $50 a month U S and you know, I've taken yeah. over 60, I've taken advantage and taken over 60 courses on there. Um, so yeah, I get what you're saying. You can always uh, improve yourself. Um, there's one question I wanted to ask you. Oh, what have you enjoyed most about starting your own companies? Um, I always like, I think I'm a really good zero to one guy, I call it. Okay. And that's like zero to a million. So figuring, figuring out like the first pathways to the customer um, the strategy, um, and the pitch, like, um, mm -hmm. in my space, it's like raising venture capital. Um, the outreach sucks. I, I don't like that part of it. Like, uh, mm -hmm. trying to get meetings, but like, once I get in the meetings and, uh, getting to present like my vision, kind of mm -hmm. like what I, I just presented fully a boost to you. Um, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, um, it's, it's, uh, exciting to me and it's because I have so much um, passion for what we're creating. And I think oh, like wow. anytime I've, I've started a company in the past, like I've tried to just really light that fire, um, in the early stages. Uh, and, and, you know, as a, as an entrepreneur, like you're the only one that can sell that vision. Um, yeah. nobody, nobody really cares. So, um, mm -hmm. so about your like energy and, and your persistence on like bringing that to market. And, yeah. and, you know, it's kind of like you're starting a big, like a freight train. Right. And yeah. uh, it's really hard to get it started, but once you get <laughs> it going, like it's also hard to stop it. The momentum is just like powerful. And, yeah. um, and so um, for me, it's like, I like being the conductor of the freight train and like really like stoking the fire to get that thing going, you know? That's an amazing analogy. <laughs> I've, used, I've told my wife about that as well. I use that same analogy. So I'm just really happy. <laughs> I was the only one that thinks that way. So I'm just going to ask you uh, where people can learn more about you if they want to connect with you on your uh, via the internet or whatever way. I uh, want to learn more about Folio Boost. And then I'm going to ask you uh, five rapid fire questions if I could. Sure. Uh, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, my LinkedIn is, uh, uh, I think it's just uh, linkedin.com forward slash crypto cowboy. Um, okay. And uh, recently I've been getting on Twitter. Um, I have never had much of a presence on Twitter, but with crypto, we've decided that's a, a good place for me to be. So I'm crypto cowboy mm -hmm. SD, uh, SD is in South Dakota on, on okay. Twitter. Um, and so I'm actually pretty active over there. Um, and really it's just all things crypto. So if you're interested in that particular industry and you want to learn about it, I, I've got a lot of pretty good content that I'm retweeting and, and talking about, but yeah, those oh, are right on channels. Fantastic. Uh, so I'll ask you five rapid fire questions, uh, David, if I may. So, um, number one, what is your favorite color? Uh, blue. blue. Okay. Where did you go on your last vacation? Um, we went to, uh, Utah, um, for bike, uh, bike race. So Z like Zion national park area, Southern Utah. Oh, right on. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite meal of the day? Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Uh, probably dinner. Right on. Uh, what time do you usually wake up in the morning? Um, around five 30. Okay. And what is your favorite type of music? Um, changes all the time. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a in the moment kind of music fan. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, right now I'm listening to a lot of like house music for cycling. Um, or not. 
but I also am a big fan of country music and, uh, and like, I, I kind of like country rock, um, that, right that kind of genre. So, yeah. Cool. Well, David, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on the show today. And it's been a pleasure having, having you and learning about you. And uh, I'm just really grateful. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Matt. Good to meet you as well. Okay.